Hey there, Zach here. Did you realize that a couple of days ago we celebrated our two-year podiversary? Podiversary is totally a word now. To celebrate, we're going to take the next couple of weeks to re-release some of our favorite episodes. We've done 89 episodes in the last two years, so chances are some of these are going to be new to you. Also, while we're re-releasing these episodes, we are hard at work at putting together year three. We're shaking up the format of the show a little bit. We're going to focus a little bit more on focused storytelling and a little less on uh, just freewheeling conversation, though there's certainly going to be plenty of that in there. We're hoping that this new year of Down the Wormhole is going to be the best biggest and best year that we have had so far. We are so thankful for all of you who have come on this journey with us for the first two years. It is incredibly humbling to interact with everyone on Facebook and on Twitter, um, to see the numbers of downloads and to know that we are not alone in this adventure. So I hope you enjoy this episode. This is definitely one of our favorites. Research has shown that awe often leads to pro-social behavior. So it makes people more generous and it has other downstream effects that are good for people's overall well-being. And um, this is really interesting for research on human behavior because that seems like a really powerful emotion to have if it's going to make you more generous. And how, how true is that? And how do we actually measure something like awe? So there are all these questions that we can get into. You are listening to the Down the Wormhole podcast, exploring the strange and fascinating relationship between science and religion. This week, our hosts are Zach Jackson, UCC pastor in Reading, Pennsylvania, and my favorite national park is by far Acadia National Park in Maine, the most magical place in the world. My name is Adam Pryor. I work at Bethany College in Lindsborg, Kansas. My favorite national park is also Acadia National Park, despite the fact that Zach stole that answer from me. It is a national park. We can share it. My name is Rachel Jackson, rabbi at Agudas Israel Congregation in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And my favorite national park is Yosemite. Ian Benz, associate professor of elementary science education at UNC Charlotte. And my favorite I guess I'll more say heritage site, world heritage site or something along those lines, is Or one of my favorites is the Eagle's Nest in Berchtesgarten, Germany. Kendra Holt-Moore, PhD student at Boston University. And my favorite national park is the Grand Canyon National Park. Why, do you ask? Are we talking about national parks this morning? That's a great question, Kendra. (laughs) Why are we talking about national parks? Yeah, why? Why, Kendra? (laughs) What's going on with national parks? Well, let me tell you, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We are starting a new mini-series on big emotions. And what greater trigger of big emotions than big national parks and beautiful natural scenes? Uh, And so today we are going to start off this mini-series talking about the emotion of awe. And so my... um, experience at Grand Canyon National Park is something that I immediately think of when I think about awe. Um, Because (laughs) if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, it really is awe-inspiring and is not something that, like, I've seen pictures. I had seen pictures of the Grand Canyon over the course of my life. I'd even driven past it one time in high school with my family. And we, like, stopped and got out of our car and looked at it from the side of the road. It was not until several years ago, my husband and I went on a camping trip to uh, the Grand Canyon for an anniversary, and we stayed there for about a week, and we had time to actually explore the canyon, and we walked along the rim, and we hiked several miles down into the canyon and saw the vast scenes and also had time to, you know, use field guides to identify the small flowers and plants that grow along the edges of the canyon. And we were able to, 
go on tours and um, learn about the people who dwelled in and around the canyon. And the few days that we were there, it was just so incredible. And I was able in that time to fully appreciate the the vastness of it, the canyon, both in terms of how large it was and how small that it made me feel. And that it was just a, an incredible feeling. And I um, felt like it was something that I shared with my husband, Chad, and with other people that we saw while we were on that camping trip. So the emotion of awe itself is not something that is uncommon. Um, we're talking about national parks right now, or that was our opening question for today. And that it is true that one of the most common triggers of awe for people um, are natural scenes of beauty. And it's um, so it's not unusual that when people describe an awe experience, they are probably climbing a mountain or looking out over the ocean or, you know, climbing down into the Grand Canyon. Uh, and so it's a good uh, example to use to try to communicate what it is exactly um, that we're talking about when we talk about awe. And so uh, the basic characteristics of awe, uh, in order to understand those, we have to look back at uh, some research that was published in 2003. So almost 20 years ago, um, a couple of researchers, Jonathan Haidt and Dr. Keltner, they uh, published the article that would become sort of the basis for research on awe. And anything that you read uh, more recently about awe is building on this uh, article from 2003. And the main two characteristics of awe that they give are that um, awe experiences, they trigger perceived vastness and the need for accommodation. So vastness and accommodation, that's what you need to have an awe experience. And what exactly does that mean? Uh, so perceived vastness is the more straightforward piece here. Uh, we're talking about something, again, that's why we're talking about natural scenes of beauty. It's something that is usually very, very big and not just physically big. It could be metaphorically big too. So um, what does that mean? Like social status. You might have a sense of perceived vastness if you're thinking about a leader, like a national leader or, or something. It doesn't just have to be like a big mountain. Um, and so vastness is something that can mean a lot of different things, but it, it communicates this um, grandness or depth. And then the second piece of awe, um, the need for accommodation. This piece, I think, needs um, a little bit more de description, but basically... It means that whenever you are experiencing awe, you are in the presence of something or th that trigger of awe for you is something that doesn't quite fit into your mental schema or it doesn't quite fit into what you understand to be true and real about the world. And so that awe trigger is something that needs to be accommodated into your cognition in order to make sense of it. And so if you think about I uh, just used the Grand Canyon. Whenever I was at the Grand Canyon, I had never seen something like it before. I knew it existed. I'd seen pictures of it, like I said, but those pictures and descriptions of the Grand Canyon, they just don't feel the way that you feel when you're standing before it. And so I felt like I needed to update something about the way that I experienced the world and that moment in order to make sense of it. And of course, the Grand Canyon is vast. So that's the, the straightforward <laughs> perceived vastness part of my <laughs> awe experience. So um, this need for accommodation is just a, a way of saying that awe triggers, they are unfamiliar and they cause you to be uncertain because they are so amazing or big or you know, just like unknown. And so that these are the two things that will indicate to you that you are having an awe experience. And there are all kinds of things that can trigger awe in this way. But these two characteristics are the basic, basic ways of describing something that um, creates awe. And we can see it in religious communities. Uh, a, a lot of religious experiences um, create awe and they're there are a lot of discussion that we'll go into um, of the, the social function of awe and what that does for a religious community and what it does um, for people as they go about their lives and relate to others and relate to, to the world um, and to 
their gods and all of these things. And so this is the the basic description. And so I think from here, it might be useful for us to just share um, awe experiences. I know I kind of gave gave one of mine, but um, we could talk about awe experiences and then see how we might describe them and try to make sense of them and what they did for each of us. Because it's also worth noting that some of the the downstream effects of awe and why it's such an interesting thing to talk about is that research has shown that awe often leads to pro-social behavior. So it makes people more generous and it has other downstream effects that are good for people's overall well-being. And um, this is really interesting for research on human behavior because that seems like a really powerful uh, powerful emotion to have if it's going to make you more generous. And how, how true is that? And how do we actually measure something like awe? So there are all these questions that we can get into. But uh, I think that's, that's a, this is where we can start. I really love the <clears throat> the twofold definition, the vastness and accommodation pieces, because when we try to differentiate excitement from awe, right? I'm excited about something, or um, at least in in people that I talk to, the word awesome is used so frequently it's it's almost lost its meaning. So I really I really appreciate that definition. And and every experience that I have felt with awe fits both of those. Um, and similar to you of going to the Grand Canyon, of which coming from that side of the country, I have been to a couple of times. And and I want to add one piece. I went there and I saw it and it, you know, that same sort of, this is, I don't want to say this is like, it's mind blowing. Like it's just, it is so vast and so powerful. And you think, this this life giving substance of water did this water and time did this that's that is vastness so for me it wasn't just vastness of the size but like the vastness of a property of something the vastness of time because we couldn't have the grand canyon if we didn't have time so for me it was a vastness in that way not just in size um same thing when i look up in the sky and see, you know, see meteors and see um, asteroid showers and, and things like that. Although I, I, I wonder about the ability for a person to be receptive to awe. And the reason I say that is because I have also been with people <clears throat> who are seeing the same thing I am and not experiencing the same emotion that I am. We were joking a little bit about, you know, bad reviews of national parks. And on the Grand Canyon, it says a hole, a very, very large <laughs> hole. That hurts me a little bit. <laughs> that person <laughs> did not experience awe. And I, I've actually known a person um, who said the exact same thing in my presence while we were at the Grand Canyon together. And I went, oh, these people do exist. <laughs> well, that's shocking. Um, like that was another awe moment. <laughs> I had to reframe my own. Uh, I had to accommodate my worldview for <laughs> for that that perspective. So I, I do wonder that what that the trigger for awe is different for people, that it still might need both of those, but it's just like every other emotion. Yeah. It's going to be different. So I just wanted to to add that thought. Yeah, no, that is a great, a great point. And you're exactly right. Just like something that might make me angry wouldn't right. make Adam angry. <laughs> uh, and that seems highly unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, can you elaborate then on the accommodation? In what way? Yes. But in what way? So, firstly, you know, uh, Rachel, with your example, you talk about Grand Canyon, you really emphasize vastness. Words that, what's the accommodation in there? I need to better understand what we mean by accommodation. So, for me, I'll jump in here so that Kendra can have a second to frame her thoughts because she's very good at that. For me, the accommodation of, I had no idea, the, my worldview, I had to change and make space for hence accommodate 
um, my understanding of the world for it to include something that I was witnessing and experiencing in a way that I'd never experienced before. I'd never been in a place where you could see time. Right. So okay. again, for me, the vastness was time. It wasn't just space. I'd been, like, I grew up in, in Colorado. Space was not, the vastness of space was not something big. And the Rocky Mountains are fairly new <laughs> as, as geological <laughs> time is concerned. So that didn't, yeah. that didn't cause an awe there, but the vastness of time. And so then I had to accommodate, wow, I can actually see time. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I, I'm making a motion of like, it, it blew my mind. Like that was the accommodation that I made. So perhaps Kendra okay. has a, you know, actual study in science, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a psychology piece, but that was my emotional response. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And a another way to put the accommodation piece is that you are experiencing um, a novel or unfamiliar thing and it's destabilizing. So to see the Grand Canyon and to, to give another example, and um, for me, this example I'm about to give was also something I would say it was a more religious experience for me. Um, so I uh, went on a family vacation right before I went to college uh, with my family to Hawaii. And I had never been on islands before. And I had never stood on an island and looked out over the ocean, able to see other islands in the ocean. And that just yeah. like describing that might not seem like that amazing, especially no, no, no. to someone no, who I, lives no, in Hawaii. But as someone who grew up in Texas, where like there's not much ocean to begin with, if you're living in like the Dallas Fort Worth area, this was incredible to me. And I was standing on the edge of um, Maui. We were doing some kind of driving tour and I could see the shadow of the island stretch out over the ocean mm -hmm. And just, it was like the most beautiful day. And I was looking out over and seeing other like masses of land. And I just, and also at that time, the uh, religious experience of it for me was that I felt, uh, I remember like narrating it to myself, like this is a moment in which I feel very small. And it's actually kind of disturbing to me, it, like a kind of smallness that I don't normally feel on a day-to-day -day basis because I normally am able to easily make meaning and uh, find significance in life through activities that I pursue, relationships that I have. But in that moment, it was unfamiliar to have this feeling of smallness. But I also found it to be a positive experience because I uh, also had the thought of like, God created all of these things. And this is something that felt both positive and negative for me. Um, but the okay. the reason being that it was an unfamiliar, destabilizing experience that I had to take a moment to narrate meaning into for myself. And I think that, that that was me trying to like accommodate that experience. Whereas if I lived in Hawaii and every day, like the ocean was just my backyard <laughs> over time, that might not be so awe-inducing. Um, it, it can be, and there are certainly people who have repeated right. awe experiences. Um, so that's not to say that you can only have awe uh, one time with each awe trigger, but um, it does change for people. It's very personal, and it depends a lot on other contextual fact factors of your life. Um, but I think that there has to be something that requires that uh, piece of accommodation for it to really hit you in a way that most people would describe as awe. Does that help well, make can, sense of that? If okay. you were like the the Reverend yeah. Kenneth Makuakane, who uh, was on one of our earlier episodes, right? who spent his entire life in Hawaii and still is uh, just enthralled with everything that he sees from the littlest bug to the biggest mountain. Yeah. Some people are just built for it. But you know, when mm -hmm. when you were you asked this question first in our in our planning Slack uh, about experiences of awe, I I have a lot. Um, I'm kind of one of those people too, and 
I just, most of them had to do with, you know, like the first time I saw Saturn in a telescope or the first time mm. uh, I drove past uh, windmills, uh, uh, wind turbines and got to see how huge they are up close. And they were all like bigness and, and, and just spatially big. But as I'm hearing you all talk, I think the most impactful one for me was very small physically. Um, and I think I've probably mentioned this on the podcast before, but I, my undergrad is in ancient languages, uh, in Greek specifically, mostly. And I went to a, an exhibit at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia on Cleopatra. It was this traveling exhibit and they had all these artifacts from, from Egypt. And one of the things that they had was a, a papyrus document that is potentially the only surviving original document written by Cleopatra, who is what, just an incredible human being. Mm. Like, don't believe anything Hollywood has told you about her. She was the most capable ruler of of her time. Knew nine languages. Like, I, I could I could go on about Cleopatra. She's a, she's the best. But this letter was there behind glass and illuminated kind of on its own in the middle of this room. And I walked up to it and, you know, people were walking by, looking at it, reading the plate and moving on. And I walked up to it and I had this realization that I could read it. And I started reading the letters <laughs> and, you know, without my lexicon on me, I couldn't figure out everything that it said, but I could pronounce the words and I could get the gist of what it was. And it was a, a letter commending one of her friends to Rome. And it was basically like, bring this to wherever you go and they'll take care of you kind of letter. Um, and it, she signed it not with her name, but with the word Gineste, which means make it so. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> a little Star Trek tie -in. or amazing. Or like, make it happen. <laughs> Or like, it will be done. Just this, this total badassery that is Cleopatra. Um, but I had this moment where I felt unhinged in time. Where I was no longer in 21st century Philadelphia looking, uh, walking around an air-conditioned museum. But I and mm. Cleopatra were together in Alexandria thousands of years ago. And I was in the presence of something that she potentially handled and touched and thought about and put her mind into paper. And I'm feeling some all right now, just listening to you. I know. Like, it is one it. thing to read about history. Like I love reading about history, but to actually experience history in that way, it, it, it was a step beyond looking at a pyramid because it was getting into the mind of a person, um, a person that I admire greatly and that, you know, lived 2000 years before I was born. And th I had to make space for that in my mind afterwards that I felt like I knew her, like we were friends because I'd read her mail. And like, <laughs> I study the, the Bible in the original language, but it's, it's written on with modern ink or on a screen or you know with a font and so right. there's one level removed from the history but to read it in a handwriting um untouched uh, un, un unmodified um <sighs> i still get chills thinking about that moment and it's very small it's a very small little document and most people who walked by had did not have that experience with that document but it unlocked something in me that I just, I don't know if I'll, I, I, I definitely won't be able to put it back in, <laughs> I can't go back to, <laughs> to pre that experience. And do you feel like that experience, Zach, like, what did you feel for the rest of the day? Or like, do you think that that had any impact on like the rest of your week? Did it change mm -hmm. something in how you felt for the rest of your life? <laughs> It did. It was funny. I was there with my mom, yes. who's also a big history nut, but um, 
mm-hmm. not an ancient language scholar. And I was like, mom, come here, come here. I have to show you something. And I'm like jittering over here. And she's, you know, looks at it and she listens to me. Wow, that's really neat. And then we moved on. And like, I had this, I was like jittery for the whole day and then had this realization that it was only me and that I couldn't share that with anyone. And I couldn't express to anyone else this feeling of awe. Um, I couldn't like drag somebody over and show them this great view, this Grand Canyon. It was like she and I had this experience. Cleopatra and I had this experience and it was impossible for me to share it with anyone else. And so I, I felt this this sense of awe and intimacy that I hadn't experienced with anything in the natural world before. Yeah. No, I think that's great. And I think that's also a good example of something that is physically small, but the vastness of time and human culture and feeling connected to something that is not actually in your immediate presence is like a great example of how the vastness comes into that kind of experience. And an advertisement for all of you undergrads to study the classics. <laughs> also to read uh, the Cleopatra, um, Cleopatra, A Life. It's a biography that I'm reading right now that is spectacular. So I had a similar experience to what you're describing, Zach, when I was leading the study abroad program in Germany two years ago and was at the Bible, um, was at the uh a library in Stuttgart and was given personal access to their vast Bible collection. And the uh, scholar there brought out multiple versions of the Bible and they actually have a Gutenberg Bible, but they wouldn't bring it out. They don't bring it out for anybody, which was really disappointing. But (laughs) um, to learn about all of the different ones they had. And, you know, I was, I mean, I have a picture of my hand on it. Um, the uh, one of the maybe it's the only complete Tyndale Bible in existence, the first Tyndale Bible in existence, and not knowing much about the different versions of the Bible from that time frame, the 1500s, and you know the history of it. You know, while I I appreciated it and it definitely had a profound impact on me, I feel like I need to go back because I have a better understanding of what the significance of of that. Bible was, I knew then, but I feel like I know more now, obviously, right? Because I did not know all of the different versions they had. Um, and, you know, he brought out a version of one uh, that was uh, uh, written for the Mass- Massachusetts tribe in the 1600s. Um, and it's the only known existing document with their language because their language was not uh, a written language. It was an oral language and a um, missionary had to learn the language, you know, come up with a written version of their language and then get it accepted by the elders to then create this Bible for them. And that tribe is wiped out. So it's the significance of that event of holding that Bible was just, you know, even when I still think about it, it has such a profound impact on me and human history and the negative things that have happened throughout human history, but also to just the what it took to create that particular version of the Bible, for example. Well, it's those kinds of, of experiences that I've had along the way, what led me to studying ancient languages, the intimate connection to history that connects us back to a couple of episodes ago when we were talking about the Bible. And I was sharing like my main religious experiences and the ways that I connect spiritually have to do with the study of of the history of scriptures, of the world of it, of reconstructing the history around it, and then contextualizing it and putting myself in there and experiencing uh, scripture in that way. And when I try to explain, like in a like this past uh, this past Sunday. Um, is there's uh, the, the, the text in our lectionary, which is the series that we preach on, um, had Jesus and his disciples going to Caesarea Philippi and Peter making a confession, Jesus, you are the son of the living God and all that stuff. Um, but like them being in Caesarea Philippi, which has this incredibly deep history going back 
back before the Canaanite tribes and the, this endless deep pool there dedicated to the god Pan. Like this, this I ended up spending two thirds of my sermon just painting a historical picture so that at the very end I <laughs> can give you the now let's look at the story again and isn't it so much more amazing and Richer. rich and but like I realize I have to <laughs> I have to spend so much time getting pe- painting a picture so that I can put people <laughs> there so when they read the scriptures they go whoa instead of oh and I feel like so much of my ministry is just grabbing people by the shoulders and being like look at this this is amazing <laughs> why can't you see this thing uh, uh. <laughs> Um, can I, I know that, uh, Rachel and Adam still have to like give their stories, but because I, I do have a doctor's appointment in like three minutes. I also think it might only be a 15 minute appointment. So I could come back on if y'all are still doing stuff, but can I just say something as an interjection? Okay. Um, (laughs) so one of the, the commonalities across these awe experiences that we're describing or a couple of commonalities are one often they make us feel small and not necessarily in a bad way, but small as in like we are one piece of a larger like human (laughs) experience and that we can feel connected to human experiences across time and space. But that realization also helps us to feel like our needs are not the most important um, and that we are not the most significant part of existence. And that piece is really important for a lot of the research on awe that shows that there's this connection to pro-social behavior. And it's still something that's like in the works, but one of the um, important like foundational studies for this uh, kind of more common strain of research on awe was an article, I think in um, 2015, that ran a series of studies showing that after people experience awe, these things that we've all been describing, this feeling of being connected to something greater than ourselves, um, maybe feeling a little disturbed or destabilized by that, but being drawn in to other human experiences, that after people feel that, they um, might be more generous with their money, or they might be more likely to like stop and help someone who like dropped a box of pens or, you know, different forms of just like engaging with other people and putting needs of other people before oneself. And so there is research to suggest that awe helps us accomplish this pro-social streak. And awe itself is often characterized as um, a self-transcendent emotion or uh, another way to, to put it is an other praising emotion. It it shifts your attention away from yourself to another person or group of people. And that experience of awe is what triggers these downstream effects in human behavior. And so I think that's why it's so interesting because awe is transformational in a big way and in small ways. Like not everybody feels it on this like massive scale. And some people don't really experience awe most of the time. So there is a personality factor in this. But I think this research is so interesting because awe, the scientific study of awe helps us to understand insight about how we relate to each other and can maybe even be like more compassionate and caring people. Um, so I think, I think I'm going to leave now. Beautiful. <laughs> but I might come back. So okay. maybe sorry. Soon. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> okay. okay. We'll be, we'll, we'll be waiting. <laughs> Um, Adam, could you give us your thing? Because I, I, um, I want to hear it first of all, and second of all, I want to, in in his own words, I'm curious about what Ian chose. So, um, I'd love to hear from you, though, Adam. Before I then have to interrupt, <clears throat> maybe that small portion of the population that doesn't have experiences of awe, 
is, is what I'm maybe discerning out of this. <laughs> Some more excitement. Oh. Then awe. No, See? I, okay, so. Well played, sir. <laughs> That's not fair. I okay, so I probably have experiences of awe. I could probably characterize those experiences in terms of vastness and accommodation. I'm not particularly convinced of the predictive power of those descriptions put forward. <laughs> You want to unpack that a little bit? <laughs> Which I could agree need, with that. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to need, need to, to explain, but you know, I, I actually think I just that? said for the record that I agree with Adam a little bit on something. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, like, I, I uh, in general, struggle with the claims of social scientific research around emotion. <laughs> this is going to be a great series. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to say that at the same time that I'm doing this podcast with you guys, right, I'm, I'm teaching this class with a mathematician. And one of the books we're reading is called Proofiness by Charles Seif, which looks at debunking uh, various ways in which numbers are used in order to generate a level of certainty in in wider public. So when I look at some of the articles that Kendra gave us, I am seeing the same sorts of fallacies that I'm describing to my students appear in these sorts of papers. And it makes me suspicious of how well they actually predict what's going on or whether they're identifying bunk patterns. Which is? Which is to say they may descriptively work really well. But they may not actually be able to predict how it is that awe creates behavior. Okay. So that there may be two sorts of fallacies here. One, a sort of um, regression to the moon kind of fallacy, right? That they're finding mm-hmm. finding patterns and data that don't actually have predictive qualities. But two, that there's a certain level of confusion of correlation and causation mm-hmm. in the way the results are presented. You said that very diplomatically. I like how carefully yeah. you're choosing all of your words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I just, so it, it makes me very saying, suspicious. So like if I can just make it a real world. It, uh, um, so the research would suggest. <laughs> Let's translate this. So the research this. would suggest <laughs> that if you take a person. Um, well, okay. So um, Edgar Mitchell, uh, the astronaut. Uh, in the Apollo missions, uh, he said that when you see Earth from from space, you get a kind of planetary yeah. consciousness uh, in which all the borders disappear and you're overwhelmed and you want to take every single politician and drag them up to space and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. Right? That's what he said. Not me. I mean, I said it mm-hmm. too, but whatever. Um, I'm just having you first. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And so the predictive model of this would say that you can take people, you can take jaded politicians and take them up to space, force them to look at the earth, and they will come down and be better people because of what the data seems to show. But what you're saying is that if you were to take people up to space, the sorts of people who would have an all experience are the sorts of people who maybe would have been compassionate anyway. And so it's a self-selecting yeah. group and the sociopathic politician who is not going to have an all experience and is not going to change their ways anyway. And so it wasn't the all experience that would have changed them. So you agree with the definition of vastness and accommodation, but well, not the extrapolation of what you can do with that definition. Yeah. And and I mean, I think what's interesting to me, right, is, is, is I, I kind of look at this and I go like, okay, if I can't extrapolate from the definition, then does it have inherent explanatory power that other definitions of odd don't have? Mm-hmm. Right? Which would be to say, like, there's a little part of me that says this is, you know, just sort of stolen from 19th century German hermeneutics. Right? <laughs> this This definition looks like 100 years old in my mind. 
mm-hmm. except it's dressed up with some numbers. And that that always kind of worries me. But also, I I am like still not sure that I actually have tremendous experiences of awe. So you I, could just be that jaded person. I, I could be the jaded person. I and I don't mean to sort of play that out as like a like stereotype or that kind of thing. But like when I think about my experiences of awe, they're often in relationship to the mundane. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not like I could frame it in terms of a description of vastness. I could certainly do that. It's certainly not the language that I would initially use, though. Mm-hmm. And if there's not an explanatory power in terms of the predictive quality of the definition that's here, then why would I do that? So I'm going to make a terrible parallel. Ter- terrible. <laughs> um, it's it's almost like asparagus urine. Go on. It only smells. <laughs> yeah. So, Clearly right? this is the title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We um, definitely found the title. Yeah. All and All. asparagus urine. <laughs> there you go. Um, a person who has a particular protein, I think it's a protein. Please, some biologist correct me. That was not my F field ever. So I believe it's a protein. A person who has uh, some chemical in their body makes their urine smell really bad when they eat asparagus. They then think, Anytime anybody eats asparagus, it smells bad. A person who does not, whose body does not have this chemical in it, neither creates the smell in their urine, nor do they have the ability to smell it. So if you create it, <laughs> if you create it, you smell it. If you don't create it, you don't smell it. Smelt it, dealt it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it almost sounds like a, if you build it, he will come. I was, I was waiting for that one. <laughs> um, so that's... Again, it's a ter- it's a little bit of a crass, but that sort of sounds like one of your struggles with this. That if you're not this yeah. person, then right. you're looking at that going, I don't I don't buy it. Like, but for other people, we might be going, it's amazing. Awe is everywhere. It's awesome. Well, so f- from a practical perspective then, uh this plays in nicely to Ian's uh, initial answer at the beginning of this question. And for those of you who are not familiar with Germany, uh, uh, you may have heard something about the eagle's nest and in a garden and been like, oh, that does sound really nice. But it's <laughs> it's not actually like mm-hmm. yeah. super nice. There's a there's kind of a dark history behind yeah. it. And if I'm understanding it right, that the goal of it was to then create something that elicited awe in order to make people better. Uh, But maybe you can unpack that a little bit more. So the original idea was to instill as, you know, it was Hitler's Southern Germany base, you could say, like home. He didn't go as much. He wasn't there as much as he was Berlin because he had a fear of heights, uh, which is kind of ironic. Um, (laughs) But what was interesting, the, so just quickly, the the history of it, and you know, there's there's lots out there on it. It's a really interesting part of Germany because one thing that um, some people may not be aware of is that there were many many houses of of some of the top German Nazi commanders were built in Berchtesgaden, and from those houses there were tunnels, um, and there was a almost a full underground city that was built that if I don't think it was complete. I think it was close that if they were able to get down there, the idea was is that it was a multi-level city that they could have survived for up to two years if they had the provisions necessary. There was even a hospital um, and stuff. And the the intent was that if you know they were there and that they knew the allies were moving in, that they could have gone down there and the allies wouldn't have been able to get to them uh, because of the security. And there was... I'm not sure if it was finished again, but the, at least a connection to all of these houses from the top military, not the Nazi leaders uh, from that party. And so what happened was, is that when the allies moved in and took over Beatrice Garden and the war ended, none of that was able to happen because they weren't all there yet. The leaders were not down there yet. Um, when the allies handed it over, the first effort uh, um, that the Germans wanted to do was to destroy everything. Uh, that had anything to do with Nazism, rightfully so. You know, it's 20 years after the war. It made perfect sense. Um, but 
people stopped the uh, Germans from destroying the eagle's nest because they wanted to be able to turn it into something good is a good way of saying it to take, you know, but at the same time too, to not erase the horrific history associated with that location. Um, So there still is, you know, information there. If you go um, that talks about what the purpose of the eagle's nest was, what the purpose of uh, the golden um, elevator that was built into the mountain and how, you know, what the symbolism of that site was. Uh, but then they also talk about what they've done since then. And, you know, it's a museum tourist area. It's also a restaurant. It's a beer garden. Um, and the mountain location of where it's at in that part of the Alps is absolutely stunning. I, I mean, you know, when I went there and I've been a few times, but the last time I went, uh, Anne was with us, um, it was before we got married and just, you know, the, the awe you experience, first of all, about nature, um, it was just amazing, uh, to me while being up there and, you know, seeing how, you know, understanding over time, how the mountains were, were created and all those things too, and the views. Um, but then also too the efforts that went into developing this place and turning an entire you know, town of Berchtesgaden, which is a beautiful little town, um, into a Nazi stronghold and what they did. And you can still access the tunnels. Um, there are tours that go down there. Um, and, you know, what they did to try to survive, thankfully it didn't work for them, but it's still, you know, the design of that place in the, the, there were no roads going up there. They had to build all the roads. They had to build a golden elevator into a mountain is, is it, it definitely instilled some awe in me as well. And so, but as I said, what I love that they've done with the place is that they've not um, erased the history of it. They've put it front and center of, you know, originally this thing uh, was designed to instill fear and power and it represented hate and just horrific human activity that can never be apologized for, right? And you can never forgive. At least I find it would be very challenging to forgive those actions, but um, that they they put that front and center and they turn it into something else. And I, I that's always impressed me with how the Germans have been able to do that with some things. Agreed. So. Agreed. And um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. And I, I want to respond um, emotionally, not yeah. not intellectually. Um, right. Many of us have the ability to, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. I find that I can compartmentalize my, my intellectual side and my emotional side um, sometimes. And my first reaction is when you said eagle's nest was prickling mm. was just a like almost vomit inducing disgust which disgust will be an emotion that we will bring up another time but it was mm. it was visceral and it was powerful and it was like it was hard and then I went no this is my friend I I respect him so I want to hear what he's saying and I really appreciate what you're saying and I think that a historical site can regardless of regardless of what it looks like how you handle that in the t- contemporary times of what happened there i think is really mm-hmm. important and this particular site that you're talking about um has been in the news um and sort of gone through the jewish circles a bit because there is a um what do you call it when someone's on the ballot? A, a, a candidate. Ca- thank you. A candidate mm-hmm. for Congress who went there. And this person said, the vacation house of the Fuhrer. Seeing the Eagle's mm-hmm. Nest has been on my bucket list for a while, and it did not disappoint. Strange to hear so many laughs and share such a good time with my brother, where only 79 years ago, a supreme evil shared laughs and good times with his compatriots. 
And that that hit yeah. very differently than what you're saying. Um, but when, again, when I hear Eagle's Nest, I'm like, hmm, turns out I would not find all there. <laughs> that would not be, that would not be a place. Um, so appreciate what you're saying and how mm-hmm. we also separate out those pieces and that awe does not necessarily mean like you can have negative awe. I am in awe that somebody has the audacity in 2020 to think that that's a good thing to right. say. Actually, this person said it in 2017 and only recently deleted it after some backlash because <laughs> turns out it's inappropriate to say. Right. Um, at least from and my I opinion. Wanna, can, so, can I interject real quick, please. Rachel? I'm sorry. Please. Um, and I, I'm glad you brought up the idea of negative and positive awe because I think, you know, for me, the positive awe was seeing the the view, the nature, mm-hmm. right? Um, it was just breathtaking. Um, the negative awe is what that house originally stood for. Um, and especially someone who grew up in Germany because of the evil atrocities of that, of the Nazis, um, that if I were there and heard someone ever say something like that, it would take a lot of, uh, energy to not lash out (laughs) at them. Because to me, that shows a profound level of ignorance and hate when someone talks about it in that kind of light. You know, when I talk about, when I think of Eagle's Nest, the first thought I think of is the, you know, the, the mountains and uh, the town of Berchtesgarten. But as I said, I, I love the fact that Germans refuse to erase that from their history of saying this is what this thing was originally built for. And it would be interesting to have a conversation with that gentleman to ever find out, did you pick up on that? Mm. Did I, I you can answer see that. what they did? I, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're, they're embarrassed. So, yeah, no. um, yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, and that's, <laughs> that was the tie in that does, does eliciting awe actually predict a, a certain benevolence of the pro-social in a person, right? Does it make a person more pro-social or is it not, actually predictive in that way because this is you know this is the argument that so many people have about confederate monuments and flags mm-hmm. that you you leave them up um in order to teach history and people will see it and they'll they'll be filled you know reviling history and it will change them and they'll be better people you know as a kid i went to um i went to dachau as a as a kid and i i mm-hmm. saw what was left of that concentration camp and, you know, filled with this dread, uh, still seeing bullet holes in places. And uh, that changed me in, in some pretty profound ways as a 10 year old. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, if if I'm already a person who is susceptible to that kind of uh, benevolence, then what good is, is it doing to keep that there if it's not actually changing people? Yeah, and I think yeah. I think also an answer to a monument. There can you know you still have to do the work of recognizing the history, right? And I think right. Germany has um, has been very honest and open about their history, and um, they have done a good job mm-hmm. of um, uh, figuring it out. Of you know of trying to do what they can to say let's never do this again. Of let's not let never again, right? Not let this happen. Not every culture has. And I think our culture, certainly our country is certainly still grappling with that. Um, But again, which is fascinating being that the thing that Germany was grappling with happened 70, 80 years ago versus the, you know, the civil war that our country was grappling with happened 150, 160 years ago. And we're still struggling with it. And I'm not saying Germany is not struggling. They are but they have done a much better job of dealing with that situation than we have with our right of being open about anti-Semitism, mm. about open about their past, and you know it's illegal to be <laughs> just because it's illegal doesn't mean it doesn't still happen, right? Let's not be naive, um, right? Uh, yeah, it's illegal to be a Nazi. Well, <laughs> tell that to a Nazi, like <laughs> they right. don't they don't really care um, if it's illegal. So, so yeah, I think ah, uh, you know, I am I am in. I will use this word in very, very intentionally. Um, I'm a little caffeinated, so perhaps that's where the jitters are coming from. But like this conversation has been really um, eye-opening for me. 
right? Our whole, like, what what is, like, all five of us, like, this, it's been so fascinating to hear each person's reaction to the world around them and how it's perceived. Mm-hmm. Um, Zach, you've been a little bit quiet, and Adam, you as well. And you can be, that's fine. I just... I'm just... I'm, I'm in awe. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, this... <laughs> It, it, these are pieces that make sense to me, and I and I don't want to like, I I don't want to like throw social scientific research onto the bus. That's not Please like don't. necessarily my point, but <laughs> but there is this piece that I I do I do sort of look at, and and to me, what's interesting about having a wider conversation about the role of emotions in these fields is is this question of of what's the what's the value in quantifying emotion, right? Which I think is a sort of critical aspect of the scientific study of emotion, that there is a way to quantify. uh, There is a way to quantify and predict how emotion relates to human behavior. And I think that is a really interesting assumption. Um, And one that I find myself both drawn to pragmatically I'm, I'm finishing up trying to give a survey to freshmen in order to to deal with like social attitudes in terms of how that will affect things like retention and their ability to graduate. And I trust mm-hmm. that, that it can be a really helpful tool. <laughs> While on the other hand, also looking at it and going, there's a tendency to give such trust to the social scientific descriptions of emotions that lose something of a wide philosophical and religious tradition that doesn't lend itself to quantification, that doesn't describe itself in nice variables that can be measured. One might argue, does it have to? I, yeah, that's, that's exactly the argument that I would want to put forward. I, I'm not sure that it does. And yet, (laughs) right. Um, there are certain, reasons why I do want to measure it. Why, why I like there, there are pragmatic reasons there that I go, yeah, um, I, I can certainly get more research dollars if I put a couple numbers on that. Also the difference between absolute and relative. Right. Uh, and, and these, so these are places that like, as metric. we, as we're like exploring these, these sort of like emotional cues that exist in like a language between religion and science, I, I get really excited about this topic because it's both um, I think really promising and maybe I, one of the most immensely frustrating areas in religion and science. It's one of the most frustrating parts of the the Bible to me is the book of Job, oh. where Job... Well, that's frustrating on so many levels, it's hard to start quantifying. Well, I mean, the, you know, the whole thing <laughs> is, this, is this discourse on the problem of evil, and then at the end, God steps in to give an explanation... And then spends two chapters saying, uh, hey, Job, you've lost your sense of awe. Here is, here's some bigness for you to chew on. Do you, do you really then have anything left to say? And at Job goes, wow, now, now that I've been surrounded by this vastness and I feel like I need to recontextualize my existence, I, I have reframed the question, and now I am. I have nothing left to say. And then God goes, "Great, you got the point. Here's some more kids," and <laughs> like that's that's the end of the story. Is you forty chapters later? There you go. Right, like life is unfair. God gave you up to all kinds of horrible things, and the answer to it is rediscovering awe and using that to reframe your existence and all is well. And that, <laughs> I mean, I get it. And that can help in times of of struggle. It just it it it, it feels dismissive, and uh, maybe maybe taking the predictive quality of of what all can do to a person and making it universally accepted, you know, by everyone that this is what you do in order to get out of get unstuck when the world is unfair is, you know, can you hook a leviathan? I think not. Sit down, son. <laughs> you know, I've told you that one of my favorite, like, like one of my favorite Love one act plays is uh, is uh, Robert Frost, The Mask of Reason. Hmm. 
which is the 43rd chapter of Job. Hmm. Yep. Um, and, and does explicitly this, right? Like it's, it's <laughs> Job in heaven still waiting for God to give him an answer and his wife <laughs> poking him uh, to, <laughs> to ask yep. and he won't. <laughs> I wonder how Kendra feels about that. We'll have to ask her. <laughs> I know. I feel bad that like she left and I was like, suck it. Yeah, frost. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so I know we're running short of time. I, if it's okay with you guys, I would like to read a poem that was written by Yehuda Amichai, an Israeli poet. I'll read it in English because Hebrew would probably get lost to most everybody and that's not the point then. Um, he doesn't use the word awe. He uses it's or rather this translation, um, translation from Hannah Block and Hannah Kroenfeld. Um, they don't use the word ah, but they use the word joy. So I'm substituting that. Okay. Um, but but can we hear it in Hebrew too? Because it's poetry and it's it's supposed to be heard. It's very long, or not? It's not long. It's it's expressive in the Hebrew. So I will find it for next time, and then you can okay. decide if you want it. Huh. The precision of pain and the blurriness of joy. I'm thinking how precise people are when they describe their pain in a doctor's office. Even those who haven't learned to write and read are precise. This one's a throbbing pain. That one's a wrenching pain. This one gnaws. That one burns. This is a sharp pain and that a dull one right here. Precisely here, yes, yes, here. Joy blurs everything. I've heard people say after nights of love and feasting, it was great, I was in seventh heaven. Even the spaceman who floated in outer space, tethered to a spaceship, could only say, great, wonderful, I have no words. The blurriness of joy and the precision of pain I want to describe with the sharp pain's precision, happiness, and blurry joy. I learned to speak among the pains. This has been episode 53 of the Down the Wormhole podcast. As always, thanks for being on this journey with us and a huge thanks to our patrons over on Patreon who make this show possible. If you'd like to help us out with hosting and recording costs, you can find us at patreon.com slash down the wormhole podcast. Make sure you're following along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well because we are officially in year two of the podcast and we're going to switch things up a little bit. Full episodes like this one will be released every other Wednesday, and the weeks in between will be shorter interviews with the current Sinai and Synapses fellows. I, and occasionally one of our other hosts, will be gleefully geeking out with these incredible people as they tell us all about the intersectionality of science and religion in their lives. We'll kick things off next week with a familiar voice, Dr. Brianna Povener, whom you may remember from episode 20. We talk all about our prehistoric ancestors, evolving DNA, and why you might not want to ride a woolly mammoth. We had so much fun. So on behalf of all of our hosts, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.